Divine Truth Frequently Asked Question Session. Jesus, Mary and others provide answers to questions that are frequently asked by members of the media and public. This presentation is part of the Jesus Dealings series. Mary asked Jesus questions about arranging personal appointments with Jesus and whether he has favorite people whom he spends time with. Recorded on the 18th of November 2012 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is session one. Is it possible to see you personally uh, in an appointment so that I, you can help me with my personal growth or relationship with God? Well, it's always possible to see me personally. Um, of course, many people see me personally on a day-to-day -day basis and we get to share about their particular issues and, and problems that they face and, and their relationship with God quite frequently. So we get to talk quite frequently. But if you're talking about actually making an appointment to see me, I don't take appointments to see me. And I also generally don't see people individually. There are a number of reasons why I don't do this. Firstly, reason number one is I do not want people to become emotionally dependent upon me. They need to become emotionally dependent upon God and their relationship with God through a process. And the process is the process that I'm defining, which is this process of becoming at one with God through receiving divine love, practicing humility and living in truth. That's the process that people need to follow. The problem when people come to see me on a personal basis is they forget their relationship with God. And often many times they come to rely on me to provide answers to them that I'm capable of providing, but, but it's not in their best interest. The reason why it's not in their best interest because most of the time they need to have more personal effort in finding out the answers themselves through this process with God that they need to engage. So nowadays I resist quite strongly a person having an appointment with me to discuss personal issues with me unless I feel that there will be a large majority of people that will benefit through that particular interaction. Now, the only way in which a large majority of people could benefit through the interaction is for the person to be willing to disclose on camera and on audio the actual issue and problems that they particularly face and what kind of um, you know, response that I give to them also is then placed in the public domain. That's how it's going to benefit lots and lots of people. If a person is willing to do that, then I will consider having an appointment with them because obviously uh, an appointment is necessary because we need to set up the cameras and the videos and the, and the recording equipment in order for that to occur. But also because, um, you know, I like to arrange my time so that I have time available for myself and for other pursuits. Secondly, though, I find that many people who request or, of me an interview or an appointment have huge amounts of demands coming at me that I solve their issue or that I tell them what they want to hear or that uh, you know they have, want to have, use it as a forum to have my agreement, or they want to use me in a, in a fight they have with somebody else. They want to use me as an arbiter between the two or more people. And, and under all of those circumstances, if I notice that occurring, generally I'll, I'll, I will not arrange an appointment under any circumstances with those people. The reason why I will not is because I do not want to be involved in people's personal uh, emotional addictions uh, getting fulfilled. I want to. I don't want to support people's emotional addictions. I want to confront them, and if confronting them means not in, ha having any time with me, then that's what I will do. So I find that many people believe also that they can donate some funds to me and then demand my time. And you know, under those circumstances, I give back the donations. As Mary knows, there has been many occasions where I've given back even large significant donations to people because I felt there were strings attached and there were demands coming from the individual that I do something for them in return for what they've given me. And I believe that I want to give my time as a gift to people. I also believe that I have a choice of who I want to give it to and I will make that choice based upon a number of different factors, all of which I believe are quite pure in their motivation, but that's up to the individual who's interacting with me to determine. In terms of my day-to-day -day activities, I prefer to not make appointments because this doesn't allow flows, flow to happen. But also, I do not appreciate people just dropping in on me at, at unannounced times. 
um, because I feel that is something that is also then not honouring how I might be using my time in other in other ways. I usually make an appointment to go and see another person. So if I if I want to go and see another person, I'll always phone them first, or I'll always email them first, or I'll always let them know I'd like to see you next week. Can we make make a time? I never re- or very rarely drop in a per- on a person unannounced. And, and the reason why I do this is because I love people and I don't want to interrupt their life without them knowing that I'm going to or leaving them with the choice that, uh, that they have to reject my visit. Um, I feel many people do not give myself or Mary that opportunity and often they, dis- and we've had many people want to obtain an, an interview, a personal interview or a personal um, interaction with us when we have said no to them, they've then dropped in on us anyway. And this is a very unloving behaviour, I believe, and I tell the person such a thing generally. So generally, I do not give personal interviews anymore with people or personal help to people unless there is some purpose to it or unless it inter- it's interacting with my life personally in some manner or unless, and and if the person wants that particular feedback or has told me they want that particular feedback. If a person tells me they want feedback, then I'll give them feedback in any forum possible, public or private, it doesn't worry me. But as soon as a person tells me they do not want any feedback or they treat me in a manner that shows or demonstrates that they do not want any feedback, then I will no longer give them any feedback either. So that's the way in which I generally interact with people. Do you play favourites with people? And by that I mean, do you spend time with a favourite group of people or do you spend time with more one person than another? Definitely I play favourites, definitely. When I say play favourites, I don't play them. I I feel, uh, definitely feel, have more feelings for some people than I do for other people in terms of the feelings of love. Um, You know, I, I love everybody in the sense that I will share with them truthfully, honestly and openly everything that I feel and think at the time. However, there are certain people that are far more pleasurable for me to be with than other people. For for example, if a person doesn't believe I am Jesus, then I don't find them as pleasurable to spend time with as a person who does. Also, if a person feels that they need to, you know, spin me a yarn, you know, tell me, as we say in Australia, I should probably make that more worldwide, um, tell tell me some things so that uh, so that I do or say or spend more time with them, but it's not real, you know, they, if a person acts in a manner that's not honest or ethical or with integrity with me, then of course I don't want to spend much time with them. I'd much rather go out and spend time with any person, in fact, on the planet than to spend time with a person who's being fake with me. There are many people who come to me or come to me in my seminars who are fake with me, and I tell them that they're being fake with me, and they still try to be fake with me, and so I don't find them very pleasurable to spend time with. Um, I find people who have the same attitudes as myself towards others, the same desire to love as I have towards others, very pleasurable to spend my time with. I also have, uh, I also enjoy the company of people who just let me be myself. You know, they're not always analysing and always critical and always questioning every action I take. Um, you know, as if I've got some hidden hidden agenda or hidden motive for it. Um, you know, obviously, if you're constantly under surveillance by people, you're not going to enjoy the company of those particular people. So I don't enjoy the company of people who are constantly checking me out, constantly analysing what I do, constantly, you know, doubtful or mistrustful of me all the time. I don't enjoy people like that. Like I'll spend some time with them occasionally, but I don't enjoy them. I don't enjoy people. I will love them. I will treat them in a loving manner. I won't get angry with them. I won't get resentful of them. But I, but I certainly can't like enjoy their company all the time because I'd much rather spend time with people who are real with me. I also dislike spending time with people who are demanding and who are angry. You know, who just come along and expect me to do things for them or. Who, or who enter an emotional bartering system with me. I don't enjoy their company much either. I'll tell them that they're trying to enter a barter and then I'll just say, I'll leave you with that, you know, because I don't really want to spend much more time with them until they sort out that particular emotional barter. 
I don't like spending time with people who, who are just attacking all the time or pessimistic. You know, I find pessimism uh, something that is rife on the planet and something that's totally pointless and unnecessary. There is no, you know, if a person is pessimistic all the time, they need to work their way through their grief and other emotions that trigger their pessimism. And, and I don't really want to spend too much time with persons who are pessimistic all the time. I'd love to spend time with people who are optimistic, who have some, you know, passion and desire for things. If anybody has a passion and desire for anything, I love spending time with them. You know, if you've got a passion and desire for, you know, fixing up animals or, you know, you know, any pursuit, in fact, like, um, I, I'm, you know, I can spend time in a company of a person who's got some passion and desire for things that are in harmony with love rather than uh, people who are just sort of, you know, apathetic and just don't care and have no motivation. And, you know, those kind of people don't appeal to me very much. I, I want to help them if I can, but I believe a lot of help has to be, can, can only be given when a person has a true desire to receive it. I don't agree with spending time with people who have no desire to, to be real, who have no desire to be truthful, who are constantly, you know, either lying to me or lying to themselves. I don't enjoy their company. And so I certainly don't want to spend much time with those kind of people. So there's, there's, a, there's probably a list of things that I, of people that I would not enjoy the company of. And I do believe, however, and I have seen many, many people who come from those particular backgrounds, like I've seen, I've seen many pessimistic people become optimistic. I've seen many people who are just carrying around their sadness like a badge become less demanding. You know, I've seen many people become, you know, develop some self self worth and not demand that other people give them worth. You know, I've seen many people give without wanting anything back. And these kind of people I enjoy the company of, and these, I've seen many people change into those kind of people. So I love to assist people to change. And I love changing myself. And I love assisting people to change as best I am able. So if a person has a desire, a true desire, a sincere desire to change, I will generally spend a lot of time with them, much longer than many other people would spend with them. And I am often very patient with such people as well in my interactions with them and even very patient with how they treat me, because many of them treat me quite badly while I'm spending time with them. But I'm still patient with them because I feel they have a desire to change. I don't like spending time very much with people who are just critical and have no desire to change. They think they're right, who are arrogant all the time. I don't desire to spend time with that. And I suggest that the majority of people on the planet probably don't enjoy spending time with people like that either. Um, so I, I, I love spending time with people who are positive, have direction, take personal responsibility for their life, just like I do. I, I don't like spending time with people who want me to take responsibility for their life, want me to take responsibility for what they want in their life, want me to create for them. I don't enjoy spending time with those kind of people. And I think if most people were honest with themselves, most people probably wouldn't enjoy time with the people I've just listed. <laughs> when we love perfectly, do we enjoy spending time with everyone? Um, no, I don't believe so. I, I feel personally that when we love perfectly, we can, we can spend, we can give our love to every single person that we meet, but it doesn't mean that we would seek them out as an, for our enjoyment. For example, if I can, often when we look at extremes, we can see the example, right? So let's give an example. If a person decided that every time he saw me, he wanted to punch me in the face, then I certainly wouldn't seek out his company. And I don't see if I, even if I loved myself and I loved the person as well, that I would ever seek out their company. I might have interactions with them where they punch me in the face because of situation or circumstance that's been attracted by them. But I would not purposefully go out to spend time with such a person who I know is just going to want to harm me. Now let's look at that from an emotional perspective. If there is a person who I know wants to harm me emotionally, in other words, they want to attack me, denigrate me, pull me down, make me feel worse about myself all the time, why would I want to spend any time with them? Of course I'm not going to want to spend any time with them. 
I wouldn't want to do an interview with them. I wouldn't want to talk with them. I wouldn't want to have a seminar with them. I wouldn't even want to go down and row, you know, a canoe with them or anything like that if that's what they want to do because they want to pull me down and I, and I would have more love of myself than, than allowing that to continue. So I do not believe that any person who loves perfectly would always enjoy the company of another person who wants to harm them or denigrate them. They may still love them. In other words, they will treat them in a loving manner. They will never get angry with them, yell and scream at them, try to violently hurt them in return or, any, or punish them or any of those things. They will understand where the background of the individual and where they're coming from and what they're doing with their life, but they still would not want to spend time with them because in the end, you'd have to also love yourself if you love perfectly. So once you love perfectly, you would love each person on the planet as much as you love yourself, not more than you love yourself. And that would mean that you would not place yourself in situations where the other person denigrates you, pulls you down, disrespects you, and does it on purpose. Now, you may put yourself in situations where they do it mistakenly, where you know you can confront them and point out the error or whatever, but you, shouldn't, you certainly would not choose to do it on purpose if you loved perfectly. You're often very direct and frank with others, which is yep. <laughs> many times interpreted as anger. Um, can you speak to that for us? Or um, are you angry in these situations? <laughs> no, um, very few people have ever seen my anger. Mary has occasionally but very few have seen my anger. There are many reasons why I become firm with people. The primary reason why I probably, the first reason why I become firm with people would be that many times those people have asked me in the past or in the present to, to be truthful and honest and open with them. And so I am truthful, honest and open with them about what they you know, are saying to me and what I feel from them. Those same people then often go into a place of resistance, which means that their original question for me to be, their original re request that, that I be truthful with them wasn't really true. And that's when I begin to become quite firm with them. You either ask me to be truthful or not, and if you're going to ask me to be truthful, I'm going to be truthful under all circumstances, public or privately. If you ask me to, that's what I'm going to do. If you don't want me to do that, then don't ask me. Right? And so I'll be very, very firm about that. And in fact, I feel it's quite unfair for people to ask me to give my time and effort to be you know, straight with them about their personal life. And then at the same time, reject exactly what I'm saying to them because they wanted to hear something different. The majority of people I become quite firm with are people who wanted to hear something different in the first place than what I have to say to them. And they didn't have to hear even what I had to say to them. If they didn't request it, I wouldn't have told them. So, so I feel many people come to me, ask me a question, not because they really want to know the answer, but rather because they really want me to give them the answer they already want. They have already worked out the answer they want and they want me to provide it. And I can't do that. I'm going to say what, is, what I feel is truthful at any point in time. I'm not going to give the person an answer that they think they want. Now, often they get into resistance about that. And as soon as a person gets into resistance, I become firm. The second interaction that I'll be quite firm with is if a person comes to me and has a personal interaction with me that I believe is unloving in some way. In that regard, I will become very firm very rapidly with them. I will be very firm for the truth. I'll be very firm on all the issues involving that particular individual and their interaction with me. And I will not budge on the issue because I feel it's my life and I have the right to determine what happens with my life. That's, what, that's the gift God gave me, the gift of free will. This gift that God gave me gives me the right to determine how I interact with every single person. It gives me the right to determine how I allow people to interact with me, just as it gives you the right to determine the same thing. I don't have to do what a person requests. And if a person requests or demands something of me that I have already told them that I'm not willing to give them, and then they continue to request or demand it, 
of course I'm going to become firm and say, no, you need to leave now. Go away. <laughs> I don't want to be involved with that. The third time when I will become very firm is when I am presenting a seminar and a questions or a series of questions are asked that I feel are either out of harmony with love or I feel the person has other motivations for doing so. Under those circumstances, I'll become quite firm. And in fact, in, in some seminars, I've even asked people to leave. The reason why I've asked them to leave is because I have paid for their chair and I've paid for the auditorium they're sitting in and I'm giving my time for free to them without any demand for them. They need to respect that. If they cannot respect me when they're asking a question, then they need to leave. And that's what I feel quite strongly. I can be quite firm about that. You need to leave if you're not going to be respectful of the time that I'm giving you. My time is given for free. It's a gift that I'm giving. You don't have to agree with me, but you do have to respect me giving it if you want to be present in the audience and be sitting in a seminar that I've, that I've set up and provided as a gift. Now, I often allow quite a lot of tolerance on that issue, but the reality is that the more I become closer to God, I feel, the closer I become at one with God, the less tolerant I'm going to become with people treating me in a manner that is condescending, belittling and critical in my own seminars. Now, you can see through the different uh, materials I've already presented that um, I've often tolerated that kind of behaviour, but the reality is the more I progress in self-love, the less tolerance I will have that for that kind of behaviour. So that less tolerance is related to love rather than anger? Is that yeah, I don't feel angry with the person. I just feel like, no, I don't want to have this interaction with you and that's my right to not have the interaction with you. And because this is my venue that I've paid for, you're the one that needs to leave, right? If it was your home that you'd paid for, then I would leave. If it was your venue that you would pay for, I would leave, willingly in fact. And as Mary knows, I have done this many times. If I've been in a situation where I feel I'm getting attacked and it's the other person's home or the other person's environment, then I leave. I don't ask them to leave. But if it is my environment that I have created, that I have paid for, that I have set up in some way, then the other person needs to leave. And I'm totally willing to call the police and ask them to leave, get some help to leave if they're not willing to leave. So, so I feel quite strongly that that's a part of demonstrating love. There's a principle involved. The principle is they have the right to determine in their own home and in their own environment what happens with their own life. I have the right to determine in my own home and my own environment what happens with my life. Bearing that in mind, I have the right to determine whether I want to interact with somebody in my own environment or not. If I don't, then I'll ask them to go and I'll be quite firm about it if they, if they resist. Also, it's interesting that nobody ever needs to be firm with me about whether I should leave. No one has ever been firm with me about whether I should leave their presence. No one has ever, ever needed to say to me, you need to go now. Because as soon as I feel like I'm not wanted there, I turn around and leave. I don't feel the need to force myself on any person. And the fact is that if you feel the need to force yourself upon me, you've got an issue before we begin. I don't feel the need to force myself upon you. I don't rock up at your home and force myself upon you. So don't expect to be able to rock up at mine and do the same thing. I don't rock up at your seminar and expect myself to, to be able to force myself upon you if it was your seminar. I have sat in audiences of seminars many years and I've sat there patiently, you know, listening to all the material, agreeing with some of it, disagreeing with others without even having to make a stance on what I agreed with or disagreed with. When I asked a question, it was always with respect. When I, when I asked for somebody's help, it was always because I desired it. So that's what I expect people to do in mine. That's what I give. That's what I will actually want in return. That's what ethics is, right? So there are times when I allow people to get away with certain things, but that is the general principle of how I interact with every individual with regard to these issues. And how, how does that differ? If someone is angry, what is their behavior, how is their behavior different to yours? 
Well, their anger is undeserved. I don't deserve anybody's anger ever. When I am stating a truth in particular, like when I say ever, that's probably not true. If I, if I had hit them or hurt them or tried to denigrate them or pull them down or tried to belittle them or tried to make them feel uncomfortable or tried to make their life worse, then, then maybe they have some underlying reason to be angry with me. But I'd never done that in a seminar format or in a private interaction with a person. So, so if that's the case, they have no reason to be angry with me. And if they do get angry, it's only because of something I've said that has triggered them in some way. But I don't personally deserve their rage. I, nobody personally deserves mine. I remove myself if I even get the slightest bit angry from a situation generally. So, so why don't you do the same? That's why, that's why I focus on, no, I'm going to be, fo I'm going to be focused on how a person treat, how we treat each other. If we can't treat each other with love, and that's without demand, without anger, without rage, without fear, then already we've got an interaction issue before we even discuss a subject. I would like to resolve the interaction issue before we discuss the subject, or while we're discussing the subject, not, not ignore it as most people do in their day-to-day -day life. So why do people interpret your behaviour as angry? Well, I feel a lot of the times what they do is they hear the words I'm speaking, which, are, which all, all words in the English language have, have two parts to them. They have, they're a word that you can use that just describes an event, or then they have connotations of uh, emotional projection, if you like. So, so what happens frequently is a person has heard the words in their past, usually in their interactions with one or both of their parents, and they think that because I might be using similar words, right, which are just words in the English language, that it connotates the same emotional experience for them. And that's not the case at all. Um, I will be direct. I will be straightforward. I will be open and honest about what I feel. And any person who interacts with me on a one-to-one -one sincere basis knows that. They, it, it, that's why a lot of people, I have a lot of friends because they know I treat them with sincerity and integrity. That's why I have a lot of friends, both here and in the spirit world. I treat people with honour. I honour their achievements, but I also am willing to state when I feel they are out of harmony with love in their interaction with me. And in particular, if they've asked me to, I will definitely say when I feel they're in, out of harmony with love in an interaction with me. And if they then get angry with me, then the issue is not mine. It's theirs. They shouldn't have asked me. If they, don't want to, if, they, if they don't want to interact with me, don't interact with me. There's no need to interact with me if you want to be angry with me. Like if you're a person who's angry about what I'm saying, there's no need to interact with me. Just, just let me be. I let you be. Why can't you let me be? Because you have an issue. That's why you can't let me be. Right? I can let you be. So that means I don't have the issue. You can't let me be. That means you have an issue. You want to demand, you want to force something, you want to control something, you, there's, there's something going on emotionally. So I feel with every single interaction, what, a, what happens is a lot of people, when I'm very direct like this, like I am here with you about this, people then go, oh, look how much anger I have. No, I don't feel angry about it. I am just saying quite firmly that I'm not going to tolerate behavior that's unloving in my interactions with, with a person. If they believe I am before they begin, then they're out of harmony with love anyway, and they're not able to learn anything from the interaction. I don't treat people that way, so don't treat me that way. That's what ethics is. I don't treat you that way, don't treat me that way. I wouldn't come along to one of your seminars and attack you. Don't come along to one of mine and attack me. You know, I wouldn't go along to your house uninvited, so don't come along to mine uninvited. <laughs> <laughs> unless you've got some really good reason for doing so, you know. And um, these are the things that I would normally interact with people. You know, this is how I would normally interact with people. And so these are the, thing, the ways that are ethical that I, that I feel people should interact with me. So just to finish off, mm -hmm. you mentioned a few things uh, when you were describing people who are angry. You mentioned the words demand, that they have a demand, they want to force something, they demand, want to Demand, force, control, denigrate, attack, belittle, criticise. These are the actions of a person not interested in truth, but a person who wants to attack the individual 
rather than discuss the truth. See, I believe quite strongly that every single person on this planet needs to learn how to discuss a matter without personally attacking the individual they're discussing the matter with. See, what often happens in any interaction, you look at an interaction between a Muslim and a Christian, for example, right? why can't they discuss their particular religious face with some sense of logic and love for each other and discuss the pros and cons of their particular religious face without getting angry with each other? Why does it often end up in a personal attack a personal personality attack upon the other person rather than a discussion about truth. The reason why is because most people, when logic fails, they resort to attack as a way to avoid the logic. So in other words, when their own personal logical reasoning ability fails on a certain subject, in other words, they see that somebody else is presenting to them a point they haven't thought of before and they realize they probably should think of, right? Once a person does that and presents you with this logical presentation of a truth and you go, wow, maybe they're right. And then all this stuff comes up about, oh, but that means, and, and there's all this confusion and other feelings that come up that, and if a person doesn't want to feel those feelings, they will begin the personal attack. When the personal attack begins, that is the indication that the person now no longer wants to know any truth and all they are interested in is point scoring on personal attack. And I can't engage with that with a person. And this is what I wanted to clarify. Basically, mm -hmm. you're saying in the way that you point things out to people, there is no desire, you are not demanding, forcing, controlling, denigrating these things. No. You're simply uh, stating what you see as truth there in front of you. So yeah, for, for example, if a person comes to me and they say, oh, would you like to give me some feedback? And I say, yeah, that's fine. If you'd like some, I'll give you some. Um, what do you feel about my relationship with my son? I'll tell them exactly what I feel, what I've observed about their relationship with the son. I'll say, you're very controlling of your son. You're belittling quite constantly. You know, if that's what happens, that's what I will say. And how does that differ from a character attack? Well, they have personally asked me about it. I am now delivering what I believe is the truth, but, but I still love them. I still care about them. I even talk to them about what the cause is. So I even try to share with them why I believe they do those particular things to their son. But if they can't face the fact that they do them, then they're never going to fa face why. And so I will tell them quite straight, this is what I see. If you ask me, that's what I will tell you. This is what I see and observe, and this is even why. And I've had many loving conversations, and many people feel that I have loving conversations with them about these particular subjects, about what happens, and then we talk about why. But if a person doesn't get through the what, and starts to attack me and think they're being belittled by me at that point, then we're never going to get to the why, right? And I don't have a feeling within me that a person has to change. I don't have a feeling within me that they should do something different. I don't have a feeling within me that I demanded of them that they do something different to interact with me. However, if they come to ask me something, I will give them the truth. And if they're resistive to that, then I become quite firm, as I've previously stated. So you're saying also that you don't have the feeling within you of wanting to belittle or attack during the process. You actually have a feeling of love yeah. and you recognize that giving truth will help this person to grow rather than... Yes, like there's people who've been attacking me for nearly five years on the internet that my only reason for giving them feedback was number one, they asked, and number two, I wanted to first talk about what they did and then we could talk about why. But for most of them, we never got past the what, right? They never got past the what. And from that point onwards, they wanted just to attack me personally. Now, I can't be involved in an interaction where you want to attack me personally. I'm sorry, but I can't. I'm not attacking you. You asked me for feedback. If I asked you for feedback, then tell me. Right? If I didn't ask you for feedback, then don't tell me. <laughs> Why do you feel the need to tell me something about myself when I never asked you? I don't feel the need to tell you something about yourself when you never ask me. So why do you want to do the same with me? Why do you want to do something, you know, that, that I feel is out of harmony with ethics? And 
I also believe quite strongly that the majority of people, once they get past the what, and they start talking about the why, that's when true progress can be made. If you start talking about why a person does something, there are many people in families, for example, that have done terrible things to their children. You know, I've met some people who have abused their own children, who have admitted to it. I have no feelings of trying to pull them down, judge them or any of those kind of things, but I do, if I notice them feel like resistive to facing the truth of what they've done, I go, do you realize the effect that this has had on their psyche, the effect that's had on their whole life? Do you realize what this abuse has done to, to, to them? And are you willing to address the real reason why? You know, so now many people get angry with things that I say to them, and I don't really understand why, to be honest. I don't get angry when I get feedback from other people. I don't, right? So, and particularly if I ask for it, I never get angry. <laughs> so I don't, I don't see, and by the way, I get lots of feedback from people that I've never asked for. <laughs> and I still don't get angry with them. And in fact, I treat them just as well the next day that I ever have, even if I disagreed with their feedback. So I don't see why any person ever needs to get angry with another person. If you get angry with another person, you're out of harmony with love. If you're out of harmony with love, you can't expect to continue to have interactions with the same person. You can't without addressing your behavior. So, so my feelings on the matter are that a lot of people still need to learn a lot about their personal interactions with others. And they need to learn a lot about how they deal with particular problems. We can discuss truth. We can even discuss truth about me and truth about you without getting angry. As soon as we get angry, we're not interested in discussing truth anymore. We're interested in blowing our own trumpet, you know, being arrogant. We're interested in attacking the other person, denigrating them. We're afraid. There's all sorts of emotions that start coming up after that. The reality is we don't, we, we need to feel all of those emotions, but stop projecting them on the other person. We can have a conversation about any matter with any person on this planet without getting angry. You can, but, but the majority don't because they're not open to logic. They're not open to any logical discussion. They're only open to their version of the logic. That's all they're open to. You can't have discussions that are, that are, that are beautiful and, and growth based discussions, something that will help you for the rest of your life without you letting go of the emotions you have about the discussion and feeling about the actual point being discussed. And I feel that a lot of people on this planet really struggle with those particular concepts about a discussion. This is how myself and Mary have our personal life. Every single day is like this. Straight, open, honest discussion about every single matter. The majority of people can't spend 10 minutes of their time with me in the same manner that Mary can spend like days and days on end with me, right? And, and me with Mary as well. Like, you know, that, that's the beauty of it is you get to know the person and you get to have a true relationship and you don't have to get angry with each other all the time and upset with each other all the time in order to have these open, honest, truthful discussions. You just need to feel your emotions while you're having the discussion rather than projecting the emotion on the other person. Anger is the projection of the emotion onto the other person. And I certainly do not do that in any interaction with other people. I sit down with people and try to discuss the truth with them. As soon as I feel they don't want to, then I tell them they don't want to and I leave. <laughs> if I can leave, if I can't leave and it's my home, then I ask them to leave. Now, a lot of people think that that means that I'm angry. No, I'm not. I just don't want to spend any time talking about it with you anymore. <laughs> I remember a, a, a car trip I had with one lady and she says, she, she said to me something, uh, she asked me some truth about herself. So I told her some truth about her, her relationship with her son that I, that I had observed. She disagreed with me completely. And that was fine. She's allowed to disagree with me completely. We were driving in a car, in my car. Uh, it was an hour and a half trip and she disagreed with me completely. And so I didn't say anything more. And then she asked me, why am I angry with her? I said, I'm not angry with you. I'm just not saying anything anymore. And in fact, I'd prefer that you didn't say anything anymore either. And it's my car. 
So I can ask that. And she said, why do you say that? It's because, well, you asked me to tell you the truth. I told you the truth. You rejected it. That's what I want to talk about, the truth. You don't want to talk about the truth, so I don't see how we've got anything more to discuss. And I'm perfectly okay with that. So I told her to be quiet in my car. I don't want to hear from her anymore. <laughs> now, of course, she then went home and told everybody that I was in a rage with her and and off she went, you know, telling her, I'm not in a rage with her. I just didn't want to have any other discussion with her other than a truthful one. And she didn't want one. So what else can I do? I can't discuss anything with her. So I don't want to discuss anything. I don't want to discuss the time of day with her. I want to have a truthful discussion about the issue. That's what she asked for. And that's what I want to have with people. And this is where like, and people would then think, oh, that was angry. No, it was not. I was not angry. I'm allowed to open my mouth, spending my time the way I want, particularly when I'm traveling in my own vehicle. <laughs> so, so if a person can't like handle that, then don't come with me. Don't ask me a question about it. Let's have truthful interactions with everybody. That's what we need.